little disclaimer here before we get started. I am not affiliated with Fenway Sports Group. I've only been to Boston on business, but I'm going to do some of their work today, whether they like it or not. Good morning to you. Good Thursday morning. I'm Dan Kolachowicz of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer Daily Shots of Steelers and Pirates, the same place you found this. The Penguins do not have a general manager. The Penguins have a baker's dozen of known candidates slash interviewees, depending on which reports you find more credible than others. There have been some second interviews put into place, but I'm here. I'm here today to offer the mythical and all important yet third interview. This is what I would be asking the prospective GM candidates. I got three questions that I want to put to them before we really, really determine if they're worthy of becoming the next general manager of Pittsburgh's NHL franchise. And I'm going to start today with number one. And these are totally serious. The premise is obviously absurd, but the questions themselves are, are serious. Another disclaimer there. What would you do? How would you solve the Jeff Carter, Mikhail Granlund situation? And from there, like you don't, you don't even blink. You don't uncross the legs. You don't twirl the pen. Nothing. You just sit there and let them play the whole thing out to the smartest possible conclusion. And if I'm that Boston guy sitting there on the chair trying to look into this person's soul and seeing the soul rattled by the premise of another year of Carter and two more years of Granland, having already watched the horror film of their production for the Penguins this past season, I will know right then and there if I've got the right candidate in front of me. Now, no GM, no prospective GM can have a definitive solution to this because any kind of exchange like this involves multiple parties. Carter, of course, has the no movement clause. Other teams, of course, have eyes and wouldn't want either player. So if I'm the right candidate, I'm coming up with a comprehensive knowledge of which teams have which cap situations and would actually need to take on cap. And from there, formulating any, any, any plan to at least move Granland out. I'd punt on Carter, at least to the point where I would acknowledge that just because you have him on the roster doesn't mean you have to play him. If he's in town, if he's on the roster, if he's suiting up, you'd want to weigh the pluses and minuses of having him around if he's not going to be a contributor. But by no means am I going to uh, endorse, much less allow, my head coach to make him what Mike Sullivan made out of Carter, which was this righteous cause of indignation. And speaking of that, my number two question would be what type of system, what type of play in general, what type of philosophy do you feel is best suited for success in the National Hockey League in 2023, but also within whatever parameters are placed here in Pittsburgh, meaning the roster that you've got, and in a sideways kind of way, the part of the roster that you can't and wouldn't change. If I'm the right GM candidate, if I am that person, I am coming back with a very authority-sounding, let's not lose sight of who's in charge here answer. While I would respect the opinions, the voice of a two-time Stanley Cup winning head coach, If I've got something to say about the roster, it's my job to build the roster. My feeling as the prospective candidate here is that the teams that are doing it right 
in our division and arguably when compared to everyone in the rest of the league are Carolina and New Jersey. Is that fair? Would you agree with that? I'm talking to you now, not the mythical conversation that's being had. Is that fair? Carolina and New Jersey? Speed, possession, they defend, they attack on the rush, they have good enough goaltending, somehow, even when it looks like they don't. They found a way to prioritize youth and skill and speed and somehow still have enough of that, you know, that uh, the grit factor. And I'm not talking about fighting and cheap shotting and whatever else here. I'm, I'm just talking about having that that sense of the fight. You know, the the Jason Zucker sense of the fight. If I, as the general manager, could take those models within reason, within constraints, and put those players around Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, and Chris Letang, could I win? Oh, hell yes. That's the point that I'd be making. And number three, I'd ask, and I wouldn't apologize for this, and I wouldn't hesitate to do it. I'd ask how it is that they feel about having Sidney Crosby on this roster and about the franchise's commitment and the city's commitment and everybody's commitment to do right by Sid. Because I don't want a GM who's just going to nod. I I don't want a GM who's just going to say, oh, absolutely, that sounds great to me, when in fact that GM's philosophy might well be, wow, no, this is such a mistake. i got to get rid of all these guys. I've got to replace them all with a boatload of draft picks and prospects, and that's the only way I'm going to do this Carolina-New Jersey thing, people. Are you, are, are, are you all nuts? Now, I don't know the exact way to ask such a question that you're going to get an honest answer. But I'd find one. I'd work really, really hard at finding one. Because if this GM's heart isn't into trying to win with Sid and Gino and Latang while they're here, then this GM has zero chance of succeeding because their own heart of hearts won't be in it no matter how badly they want the job. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q might be one of the best I've gotten in a long time. So stick taps here to Jim. Jim comes through with, So DK, since the director of hockey operations, or the president of hockey operations, is the GM's boss, then why are the Penguins not hiring a director or president of hockey operations first and then allowing him to hire the GM? I got to tell you, I've thought about a lot of different things related to this scenario. A lot of different names, a lot of different potential storylines, and this never once crossed my mind until you sent it, as you can hear from my voice. This is this is something that really applies across the board when these types of hires are made. There are exceptions. There are exceptions. When Bob Nutting, the owner of the Pirates, cleared out his front office after the 2019 season, he did bring in a uh, president of operations in Travis Williams before the hiring of Ben Charrington as general manager, although they were really close together. But when the Penguins made their move, their combined move in hiring Brian Burke and Ron Hextall, Hextall was actually the choice the way it's been explained to me by some of the people who made the decision, before Mario Lemieux came in and said, why don't you give Berkey a call? And that's when Brian Burke was added to it. So that one, if you want to get real technical, even though they were announced together, even though they were introduced together, Hextall actually preceded Burke in terms of the selection process. My guess in this regard, and I'm going to repeat that everything that I've heard so far is that they have not, the Penguins have not made up their mind as to whether or not it's going to be a two-person structure. They're still open to the idea of just 
one pure GM. Although when you look at the field now, that seems less and less likely. Because as I'd also been reporting, I thought that was open as long as Kyle Dubas was going to be interested. And now that he's staying in Toronto, according to Dubas, there's not really anybody here in this field. There's not a bunch that even have any sort of extensive general managing experience. But presuming that it is too, then it affords you the option as the hiring people to try to form your own opinion as to how they might work together. And that's really essential, I believe, especially after the Hextall slash Burke scenario that we all just witnessed where Hextall could do no wrong in Burke's eyes. Hextall was just a saint and every move he made was gold and everything that resulted from every move that he made was gold and everything that Mike Sullivan did was gold. And I, I don't know what Burke was doing here other than sitting at a hockey rink, nodding and expressing his affinity for everything. That's not who he was for the better part of his career. So maybe he just wanted a retirement check or whatever. But if you're the Boston people sitting in this room and you're making this hire or hires, my feeling is that you're going to want someone in that upper position who you think will be able to work well with the GM, but at the same time, not be beholden to them to function as a legitimate check and balance within the system. Now, how you achieve that in an interview process? I have no idea. I have no idea at all. I appreciate the question. It was very, very good. We'll have another daily shot of penguins tomorrow.